Hi, everyone. Welcome to um, this chat with editor, director, producer Jana Koskaya. Uh, Jana's impressive editing credits include Thor, Ragnarok, Hunt for the World of People and the 2015 What We Do in the Shadows movie. However, today we are going to talk about the fantastic uh, TV show, What We Do in the Shadows. And I am a bit of a fangirl, so I'll try and keep it down a notch, but I absolutely love the show. Um, but instead of me explaining it, I thought it might be quite nice. Yana, uh, welcome. And if you just like, what is what is it? What is What We Do in the Shadows? How would you describe the TV show in like a sentence? Um what We Do in the Shadows is a documentary about um, five vampires that live in, well, four vampires and one familiar that live in Staten Island. We kind of, we tend to, like the thumbnail elevator pitch is like the office with vampires. Yes. Yeah. yeah. It definitely has it, that fantastic. It's kind incredibly of- stupid. <laughs> in the best it's pure escapism isn't it it's just something that you just go do you know I've had a really intense day and I'm gonna just totally like go into this la la land of vampires but we're very committed to the fact that it is a documentary and Mm. we follow those rules in our storytelling um so I'm going to talk about it as if it were one <laughs> yes okay well let's do that let's do that so I must apologize as well my cat keeps pushing the, uh, the thing. he's gonna just appear um okay so from now you you edit on the show and you direct and produce but I would love to talk about initially the the editing you know you as an editor aspect of it um and to understand I suppose how you got involved so you obviously cut the film um I was one of three editors on the movie uh-huh. um they also have an incredible team of Kiwi editors uh that they work with um I came in there was 300 hours of raw footage and they they had a script but they didn't show it to anybody so it was completely improv 300 hours and it was this jumble of wonderfulness that didn't really have a story but it kind of didn't matter but it was just sort of threading the needle of what are the absolute funniest bits and how do we put them into something that tells like a coherent story um and so it was just trying out different gags and we just watched it with different people so many different times (laughs) and uh it eventually took shape and they they went back and got some additional pieces of documentary to tell that story to kind of shape it more into a hard narrative structure um and that was a blast and then they asked me to do the pilot um and I said yes because I love Taika and Jemaine and um came to really really respect and and um admire Paul Sims um who's the current showrunner and was showrunner from the beginning um and uh yeah so I've been on the show since then, but um, we do have like an incredibly collaborative editorial. So I can't take credit for, <laughs> I wish I could. Yeah. Because um, there's quite, how, how many other editors work on the, the TV show? How many of you like, could you? Um, well, yeah, I mean, it's it's generally been me and one other editor that team has, uh, expanded and then we've always once an, an assistant has done a season with us we bump them to a shared credit and try to build them and they've a lot of our assistants have gone on to do amazing wonderful stuff um Varun is cutting reservation jogs and Antonia is just came off the new Greece reboot and um is doing the new Lindelof like they're they're great they're they don't need me but uh but yeah. you've given like that's such a huge thing like oh my god sorry this cat yeah. <laughs> that's such a huge huge thing to be able to do for someone's career when they work as an assistant and then to be able to give them the opportunity to cut um well but- most assistants don't want to be assistants no like they're building their career and so that's just something 
we do and they work really hard for it you know they put in a lot of time um cutting would you say it's kind of like the familiar vampire relationship (laughs) god I hope not (laughs) I hope it's not that abusive but um yeah yeah. I, I don't know I think it's just a model that we've adopted and has worked really well and has launched a lot of really wonderful editors and of course I keep losing really wonderful assistants over it but you know that's part of the life cycle yeah Yeah, no but it's the right thing it's the right thing to do and what an amazing show to to do that on Um, yeah but I should mention before we go forward forward the main editors that I work with um Dane McMaster who is brilliant and I've worked with for years um we started together on the show review and did trial and error together and I'm not okay with this and he is a, an Irish delight and um Eliza Cardinal um who has joined us for the last uh two seasons and is really really fantastic and and this this season we also have AJ Dickerson who's joined us um and then our assistants Antonio Debaras for Viswana um and um Tom Calderon who um is our VFX editor who has edited for us also and is really, really wonderful. Um, and um, oh God, I'm forgetting so many people. <laughs> well, that's okay because <laughs> I will make sure. So at the bottom of this, cause I'll put this on YouTube and I'll make sure that I put everyone's like IMDB and stuff in the bottom as well. <laughs> um, There's so- other, many other wonderful editors that I've worked with, but um, yes, yeah. it's hyper collaborative. Yeah. 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 And you can really tell like with everyone involved, like you can sort of see it in any of the behind the scenes videos and things with the actors. Um, So moving on to that aspect of it and the improvisation. So you say with the film, there was like 300 hours. How does it, or footage, how does it work with each episode? Do you like how many, how many cameras are being, being used? Like, how much footage do you end up with? How much is improvised? Like, what does it look like when it comes into your edit suite? It's a beautiful mess. Um, it's um, We get, we tend to shoot two to three cameras depending on the scope of the scene. Um, and we don't do conventional coverage because it's a documentary. Um, so what we'll get is kind of wider and tighter passes. Um, and as the actors go, um we try to get at least one or two scripted versions and then they're set free (laughs) um and they they go very very far off (laughs) um and sometimes to wonderful results and um sometimes to less wonderful results but either way it always ends up through a marriage of the scripted and the and the improv into something pretty wonderful um and uh yeah so it is we're combing through, we're pulling reactions from any of those takes and versions and they might not be married to a specific moment, but it was just like, oh, Matt made a really wonderful face there or <laughs> you know, we have to use that, that's so funny. Um, uh, and it's this mishmash and we also have our hands untied because we do these talking head interviews so we can turn a lot of what is kind of scripted scene footage into more B-roll to get through something quickly or in what we think of as a more funny way. And there's a lot of play that happens in editorial, a lot of kind of detailed restructuring of the structure. Um, and then we work with um, Paul Sims and the writers to further refine that and, um, it's it's a length it's a much longer post than um a conventional television show because it is kind of like a documentary when you get the footage it just takes more time to shape and um craft yeah I feel like there's you're really molding stuff and it's got like lots of flexibility to yeah what it could end up being just by moving certain scenes around and um like you said all the reaction stuff like that's what makes it so funny like all of the reactions of the different characters to to what the others are saying um so in terms of the you mentioned about also the visual effects like now there are some incredible like visual effects in the show phenomenal and you've got all these handhelds 
sort of camera work. So I'm sure it's not always straightforward. How can you talk a little bit about that process, like working with the visual effects editors and, you know, when these vampires are turning into bats and, you know, there's crazy stuff happening, like, how does I that mean, our, come together? Our goal is to try and make things look as real as possible. And um, I think in a, in a standard fiction series, you'd really want to feature those um, VFX and those creature moments. With us, a lot of times they're really thrown away and something you might just catch in the background <laughs> of a shot, which is my favorite kind of gag, actually, is something that's not right in your face. It's something you might, your I might be drawn to that they're digging a grave and, you know, <laughs> like in the- Yeah, can, in you the give an, can you give some examples of some of those? Like- well, not like a VFX example, but it's a background gag, like in the Go Flip Yourself episode when they're burying the brother in the background while the host yeah. is doing his, you know, his two camera and he's very foreground and he's in focus and, and it's completely out of focus and pretty deep back there, but you do- catch it and it is like this dumb thing that's sort of happening at the same time um I love things like that yeah 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 me too and and, and again like you said it's very throwaway when it comes to visual effects like the bat and obviously um Laszlo I'll call them by their characters names um Laszlo's way of saying bat and just becoming the bat is so funny and then you just think about how impressive that that effect is as well um I think one of the episodes where the with the ghosts like just the way that's done it's really yeah we have an incredible um VFX and camera team um and we as directors spend a lot of time thinking about how to make it work and to make sure we get the elements that will be able to sell um these sort of what we hope end up looking like practical effects. And um, we also fight time permitting to do as much practically um, and then maybe enhance a little bit with the VFX. Like, uh, I don't know, my favorite kind of overall um, example of that is probably the way we treated the Baron when he was a one quarter body. Um, mm -hmm. And almost all of that was done practically. You know, we, we put a a doll on the back of a dog and we um and then we just did a face replacement for a couple shots and um we put Doug Jones in a tiny car <laughs> and, then, and then just painted out his legs that were sticking out um we actually put him on a hoverboard and um and built this car around him um yeah so I love the practical effects whenever we can pull them off and then just juice those you know clean them up um mm all of our flying is done most all of our flying is done sometimes it's to digit doubles but it's almost all practical um and the bat effects is something that the camera department has really helped with because they just they really perfected going off the actors into the sky at the right time so that there's a minimal amount of actual vfx paint out work on on the actors and 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 the cast is really good at jumping and then like jumping down um so all the timing of that is worked out very carefully and thoughtfully um so yes vfx is amazing and they do incredible work but we try and give them stuff that they can um turn into that um without too much hand wringing you know <laughs> so. it's like with anything that looks like it's really easy or super smooth there's so much thought that's gone into that like you say just the difference between the actor and the way they jump can make the difference to how easy it is to make right. Right. and actually selling the effect and then the quickness of the move of the camera is like just getting off them quickly is going to end up saving us a lot of money and make it look more real and um you know it's just yeah <laughs> those are all things we think about do you do you find um and again this is a bit back to like the, the structural sort of side of things but the way in which it's filmed that's kind of office sort of documentary feel gives you a lot of freedom in the edit to oh yes, yes because get away I mean, with things in a way we get away with everything because we can jump cut our way through anything like we're not married to any kind of timing or fumble or um, if we ever want to change the pace of the scene, we're never locked into the actual timing of 
a take. Um, it's a huge gift. And, you know, there are tricks within that where we'll add camera shake on the jumps or we'll push in a bit on one side or the other. I mean, that's another way our hands are untied is we're not limited to like the standard amount you can push in on a shot. Well, first off, because we shoot 6K. So um, we have a lot of latitude before it falls apart, but also we're a documentary. So if it falls apart, so, <laughs> like, you know, the, that was a creative choice on the part of the documentarians to like push in too much on something and sometimes the kind of aesthetic of something falling apart helps sell the documentary so never worry about that um so if we don't have a close-up not a problem <laughs> like, um and all those ways um we get huge amounts of freedom but it also takes more time than to craft because we well, aren't locked I was gonna say sometimes constraints are good right like they give you when you have all the freedom, it's really down to you to just absolutely know the timing. And then, you know, especially with comedy, um, what is your what is your approach to ensuring just that that timing is right? And when you've seen something over and over again, how uh, how do you well, remove yourself from it and come back to it? I Make think it that's <laughs> something about um, this editorial team is we all have a really um, similar sense of timing and what we find funny and it is not a it's a weird way of putting it but like not a conventionally American sense of timing um I think we all have overdeveloped senses of deadpan timing um and what the perfect pause is um also um shadows is very rapid fire because of our jump cutting so within that um with you know we hate a silence and that's it's a really juicy awkward silence um which we will do because we love that pan um yeah so I don't know if that answers that question or not but that's <laughs> no it definitely does I think having similar because it's all about sensibilities right and I think again with this show I love it but I'm sure there are people that might not get it and that's like okay absolutely too. I'm always amazed that people do love it because it felt like um such a inside little idiosyncratic thing that we were making it both as a feature and, and as a show that um that it's found an audience and has fans is like delightful but also um confusing to me like I, I um uh I just never really expected it I think because it just felt like a, a a little labor of love that was very much in this very specific voice um that maybe doesn't work for a lot of people but apparently does so um good <laughs> yeah well I think that if you find it enjoyable like someone's going to right there's always going to be an audience like if you as an individual kind of and again obviously as a group um you've all yeah a labor of love like something you really love there's going to be an audience for it somewhere yeah. um so in terms of the the characters then so you've got laszlo and nadja our couple um colin robinson the energy vampire and nandor um, and then obviously Guillermo, the familiar, each one of those characters, I you feel so invested in their story. In some respects, it's hard to say, like, who who is it really about? Like, you give, give each of them enough time with their character development and their arc that mm. I feel, you know, and the audience feels like they know them really well. How do you find, both with editing and directing, the balance between that? Um... Well, it's very much an ensemble show. And even when an episode seems to be weighted towards a character or to a story, it doesn't really sing or work until the others are part of it and reacting to it. Um, so even if maybe in in the writing, it seems very much to be like, okay, this one is Guillermo's. Um, until we get in the room and bring it alive and everybody starts bringing their ideas and their looks and their, um, you know, you're checking in with how each of them feel. 
um, it, it ends up feeling very much like an ensemble story, no matter what, um, because they're just so present. Um, and it doesn't really work unless you're hearing from all of them and feeling what all of them are feeling. Um, it's just this weird kind of alchemy of character. Um, that it's they I think, at each best. other. Don't they? They really yeah, they really do. And I think it's at its best when all of them are kind of firing and working off of each other. Yeah. So um yeah, that's yeah, that's, no, 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 no. that's great. <laughs> yeah. I um I think a favorite of mine is um the curse. So uh that all coming together in the way that Nandor gets this email and the seriousness in which they take it. But then I think Guillermo's answer phone message sounded like it was the curse coming and they all just, yeah, add to the story so beautifully. Um, but like you said, there are episodes that are more weighted to one character or another. Maybe like the Jackie Daytona episode is more obviously Laszlo's story, but the others play an important role in no, we'll yeah so. I mean that one was very much a a, a Laszlo story <laughs> but, yeah. um, and, yeah. and there are there are episodes that that just are somebody as a character's journey there are Colin episodes like that and Andor episodes like that. but um but it always comes but the arc of the season mm -hmm. always comes back to include all of them which I think is the strength yeah so you have edited throughout each season, but you began directing in which season? What was your first in season two? I did Jackie Daytona was my first episode. Oh, really? oh, <laughs> yeah. So tell me, um, tell us a little bit about that transition and journey from editing to directing. How did it all come about? Um, you know, I've, I've been really, I actually thought I wanted to direct when I first got into film. Um, and then I realized that I also want a family and that maybe those things are mutually exclusive mm -hmm. um but then my daughter grew up and I went to um all these directors that I had been working with and let them know that this was an ambition of mine and they were incredibly supportive um starting with Jeff Blitz who I worked with for years um who I, I did my very first feature which was a documentary on the national spelling bee and uh, we were doing a television show together and he got me to direct on a show uh, on the show that we were cutting and everybody loved my episode and we're like you'll be back next season it's like you know you'll do more and then like that didn't get picked up um so, so yeah then um you know Jermaine and Paul um were equally as supportive of me to come direct on Shadows um and that did go well and that also went well and they also said we'll have you back and that obviously did uh continue and I came back um to direct half a season and I've been directing half seasons mm -hmm. ever since then um yeah that's how it came about but yeah um how old is your daughter now I don't she know. just turned 19 wow so um that that side of thing again maybe we sort of it feels like a tangent but it, it's not it's like an important important one to kind of sort of talk about how did you find that in terms of your career starting a family did it put things on hold like how quickly did you no, I wouldn't say it put things on hold because I, I love editing and I love what I do and I've had incredible relationships and partnerships with um the directors that I've worked with and I wouldn't it's it hasn't felt in any way to have been a sacrifice um Good. no I mean I you know I definitely turned down a fair number of opportunities but so <laughs> Yeah. yeah um I had a relationship with my daughter and I was home you know on in the weekends and I almost in, exclusively worked from Los Angeles and um was here um I don't that wasn't a compromise it was a gift uh, I I I I have a, a daughter she's six and um it's you you have chapters in your life. You just you dedicate yourself to certain things at certain times, and yeah, I don't. I, I would never feel that. Yeah, get, saying no to certain opportunities because of that time would be a sacrifice. Um, but I don't think it's always that straightforward sometimes. But and I've been really lucky to have had the opportunity to work on films I really like with people that I really like almost exclusively. So. Yeah. 
um yeah I can't complain at all and I I don't see completely leaving editorial even though my directing career has launched off I just I love it it's, it's a very happy comfortable safe place mm -hmm. so yeah um, so in turn look the cat's back hold on <laughs> <laughs> it's just at the end um so in terms of collaborating with the other editors so the do you is it is it like a timing thing like you know at the beginning of the season okay you're going to edit this one I'm going to edit this one like how does we, all that we don't actually go? break it up I mean for years it's it's becoming different now that I'm directing more and less less kind of hands-on and fully present for all of it but um it used to be that um we would co-edit every episode there would be at least two editors on every episode sometimes three um and what we would do is we would all take dailies and kind of you know ragtag put that together uh and then we would swap scenes and each do a pass on each other's scenes and then we would assemble it and then we you know so and so would take a pass at my assembly and i'd take a pass at that and we would leave each other we each take a color marker and leave each other lots of little notes and breadcrumbs. And um, we'd also cut each other lots of alts of gags because we have so much improv in different ways of doing a scene. So I'd get a really smart other pair of eyes on a joke or a way of treating a scene. Um, and then they can make a pick. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like I wouldn't have to like agonize over making a choice in the moment, which would have probably taken me a lot more time than letting Dane go take a look at it and go, oh yeah, that one's way funnier. Like, <laughs> so, um, so it is, it's completely a collaboration. It's not in, um, it's not a lip service collaboration. It's, we do it together. Um, and then with every episode before we turn in uh, a cut to a director, um, we all, everyone in editorial, all the assistants, all the editors will watch the cut and um, share notes and feedback and do our final tweaky pass, which is, um, we try and let the assistants do, um, God, don't tell the guilt that, but um, <laughs> like, but to give them, to give them an opportunity to kind of learn the process mm -hmm. and kind of get their feet wet on, on becoming editors. Um, and then we'll, you know, everyone kind of takes another final look and then we turn it over. And so it's a big, this very, very polished um, Fabergé kind of egg by the time we even give it to a director. Um, yeah, it's, it's, an, it's intensive. It feels special though. Like that feels like really special being able to share your edit and not, you know, removing any kind of ego around it and just being like, does this work? Doesn't this work? And getting people's opinion that you trust. That is incredible. Wonderful. It is the, I mean, I highly, highly recommend it if you have yeah. bandwidth um, and the trust. Um, it's the best way of working. It, it removes all the stress um, mm. and things get significantly better for having multiple wonderful minds approach it and try and crack it and craft it. Yeah. So obviously, so each episode is, like a TV half hour, right? So you're, w when you have a, a rough cut before you show an, a director, is it much longer than it's that? Actually, you no, know, it's interesting because uh, starting with season one, we had EPs that were not local. Um, and, um, you know, it was Jermaine and Paul and Jermaine in particular, really wanted things to be much closer to air ready before he even looked at it. So it very much untied our hands in terms of making lifts and bringing it closer to time. Um, the scripts are quite long for, for a 24 minute show. Um, so there's a lot that can, that kind of has to lift. So we make, we lift everything we find isn't quite earning its place before they see it. And then it's, they have, they still have, it's still three minutes over, <laughs> you know, like there's still quite a lot for them to play and chisel. And, and they will occasionally ask to see things that we've lifted. Um, but for the most part, we try and give them something that if it had to go to air, 
no one would be embarrassed or feel bad about it. Like, you know, like it's, it's pretty air ready um, when, when we give it uh, to producers. Yeah. I guess that's a big trust thing as well. They've really trusted you to like go, no, this isn't working. Let's remove it. They're not saying, oh, where's that bit? And all that sort of stuff. You're not required to turn in a scripted version. Oh, thing. Yeah. Billboard. Cause well, it would just would, they're super capable and really smart, but it would take a lot of their time hmm. to, to chisel it. And I think yeah. that they know where to put their energies and yeah, um, yeah that's one way that they've given us some, some control <laughs> yeah no that's again sounds great um there's a really nice sort of stylistic and it's both in the movie and in the series of this cutting to photos cutting to kind of like the old sort of medieval paintings and things um can you talk a bit about that as a, as a style and how it adds to the comedy and you know how you find or create those images what's the story behind that uh, well, Jermaine, Taika, and I are all really interested in art. And actually, some of the pictures that are in the movie are from my art books in here that we just were digging through as um, as we were putting the cut together. Um, and every editor and um, we have a, a graphics person, Holden, who's wonderful, um, we all have like little degrees in art history now. We've done so much research and we're part of so many archives and searches um, and keywords and we know how to find these really um, idiosyncratic paintings. Um, and it's like the first time in my life, the fact that I took an art history class has become useful. <laughs> but um, uh, yeah, so we just search and comb these collections um, and then we'll hire artists to put our vampires in them or sometimes in some ways alter paintings so that they fit our story maybe slightly better and we also have created a whole out of cloth um paintings when we couldn't find anything that really illustrated a point but mm -hmm. really felt like it needed a picture um and it's another way that um our storytelling hands are untied a lot of those are scripted and a lot of them aren't um and are just like flights of fancy that we take an editorial and go god it would be really great to get a series of paintings of like this thing um and to work it in um this talking head and so any opportunity we see like that we we try and take yeah no it's brilliant i um absolutely love like medieval doom paintings and my mum was in Salisbury recently it's somewhere in England and they have like the, one of the oldest doom paintings and I was like can you take some pictures please go into this church <laughs> I just yeah there's just something so like tantalizing about that kind of you know and obviously you've got these vampires that have lived across all of these eras right so it's yeah and it's a real sort of mix of textures as well that it brings to it um yeah. the title sequence is who cut the title sequence and where obviously the music is the same as the film um i i cut the original kind of shape of it but it went to this title house method who did an incredible job of of creating the textures and the environments um i, I picked the pictures and the timed it out but they brought it to life um and um worked with jermaine and paul also for timing and taika um yeah that was the title sequence i love it yeah <laughs> um am i right in saying that as the seasons went on there were moments where you cut back in the credits like there wasn't that you know those little kind of extra bits that wasn't in the first was it in the first season or am i making that up you know, the credits? so when the credits start and you know, like the show's finished, but then there's a little moment that we kind of go back to. I'm not sure if there's like a name for that. I might be making this up. Huh, um, I just felt like it wasn't in the first season. And then suddenly there were moments that were coming back. Oh, flashbacks, like doing flashbacks? Please? No, no, not, not flashbacks. Like, um, I guess like punctuation moments to the episode. So the episode would finish, the credits would roll. Oh, credit tags. Is that, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, 
Wait, yeah, we started we started doing that in season ones, actually. Oh, really? uh, okay. Yeah, if you if you go back and watch the credits, you'll see there are a few pops. Good. Um, yeah. In, so what are they called? What is that called? Credit uh, credit credit um, credit tags. I don't hmm. know. That's what we call them, but that might not be technically right. <laughs> we, like love, right. we love an after credit gag in part because mm -hmm. we hate that nobody watches credits. <laughs> yeah. And then there's also just gags that feel like cherries that don't quite work to end the episode, but work great as this kind of afterthought mm -hmm. moment. Um, the Jackie Daytona one was particularly funny because we were required by legal to include this disclaimer that it wasn't the Jackie Daytona band, um, yeah. which like to put in the body of the episode was so cumbersome mm -hmm. <laughs> and mm -hmm. um, unwieldy, but um, was kind of hilarious as a dumb credit tag. Um, so that was our solve for including that information that legal made us include. <laughs> And we even named the guy who made us do it uh, <laughs> in the tag, um, which I think he really, really tickled him um, and um, made everybody happy. So, yeah. yeah. Oh, I love that. Yeah. No, they again, they're, they're, like you said, the cherry on top, like little. And it is frustrating that these credits just suddenly start, you know. Netflix is the worst. I hate it. Like, I, hate it. I hate it. I want to read the. I'm one of those nerds that like yeah, likes. I know. <laughs> I was like, yeah, who edited this? Um, that's so cool. I mean, there's there's so much that I I sort of could talk about um with all the series as 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 a whole and the different storylines, but I would love to also talk to you about your editing career, like you know, to kind of touch on how you got into editing and all of that. But before we do, is there any other, are there any other little moments like from both directing and editing the show that you just would love for people to know about or like, you know, <laughs> just to put you on the spot? Part of my life for, you know, what's crazy to me is that when I worked on the movie almost like 10 years ago, like it was such a little blip thing that we were doing like here in my back house like um it uh I never expected it to be such a massive part of my life and so the fact that 10 years later I devote most of my year to crafting this show um is wild to me um I know that's not a specific anecdote but that's probably the biggest takeaway that I have from this whole experience <laughs> yeah I think it is that sense of like you don't know where something will lead like you said you felt like it was this smaller thing like you enjoyed working on but for it to explode in the way that it has and become what it has such a cult following um is something yeah. really special is there a new maybe I should know this is there a new season coming yeah we're we're working I'm actually have my avid open on the side here um we're working on <laughs> season five now and um uh we are renewed for season six so that will be going as well um it's cooking <laughs> the editors are I ready more, but yeah no that's 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 awesome um so in terms of your your career then like how I mean you're so passionate about editing and obviously directing as well but you know in terms of of, of becoming an editor where did it all where did it all start when did you realize you had a love for editing um in film school I think I was uh, you know it was one of the things when I was in graduate school you had to crew on someone else's project and I chose editing um and I was just in the room working in and then like 14 hours had gone by and I like didn't realize at all like I was so engaged in what I was doing and enjoying the process and I was like oh my god it's dark and you know like my husband is wondering where I am and um I had no idea I was just I, I completely clued into what I was doing and I was so laser focused and so enjoying it um and that was kind of a revelation. And I was um, TAing for uh, Kate Amond, who is one of the all time great documentary editors. And I, when I met Kate, 
and I went to her home and she had this very not extravagant but nice house um and was so grounded and lovely um and I thought oh my god I want to be Kate when I grow up like she is so yeah. cool <laughs> um and it was a kind of a a light bulb moment for me that like oh here is this thing that I can do that is incredibly sane and creative um and everyone I meet who does it seems wonderful um and happy and I want to be one of those people um so that was the moment and then I told Kate I kind of knew no one was going to let me edit anything until I'd edited something and so it was this kind of catch-22 to be in and I you know, because I had been TAing, I didn't really want to take the assisting route. Um, and so I told Kate, like, you know, if anybody came to her and wanted someone to work on something for free, um, that if it was great, I would do it. Um, and she had Jeffrey Blitz came to her with Spellbound um, when I was still a student. And I cut it when I was still a student, very part-time in his living room for nothing. I did eventually get paid, but um, I didn't do it with that expectation. Um, I just did it so I would have a feature that a credit that I could show people. And then that movie did beyond any of our expectations. It was nominated for an Academy Award and my career was basically set. And I continued to work with Jeff and he transitioned to fiction and I transitioned with him um, and he had a very deadpan sensibility and my movie, a movie we did together came out at the same time that Taika's first movie was kind of coming together. And so I, I worked with Taika on, on his first feature off of that. And it just kind of snowballed in that way. I got incredibly lucky to work with really wonderful people um, who were very, very talented with a very specific kind of voice that shared my sensibility um, and to have found them and for them to have found me is, you know, the one in a million kind of experience. And I'm so grateful. Um, so yeah. Well, they're lucky all. to have found, they're lucky <laughs> to have found you, right? I mean, I'm sure, you know, yeah. Working with them all like is, is incredible, but they're lucky to have you to be able to like bring these stories to life in the way that you do. Um, <laughs> what advice do you have for editors who are in the early stages of the career or maybe, you know, having a moment within their career where I, I you know, I, I get people asking me or saying a lot like, oh, I'm not sure if this, if I, you know, if I'm on the right path and all of that kind of stuff, what advice do you have? I mean, I think the main thing is that um, you have value and you probably will have to work on things for little to no money but that doesn't mean you need to work with people you don't respect on things you don't like. In fact, the fact is you should very much fight to work with people you genuinely like on things you genuinely care about, especially when you're working for little to no money. Um, and that the work you do breeds more of that kind of work. So, uh, you know, if you start out on something you don't enjoy you're going to continue working on things you probably don't enjoy with people maybe you don't like um so to make those choices very carefully early on in your career even though it may seem that can be a tall order you know when you have bills and other kinds of considerations but if you can be very frugal <laughs> Um, especially early in your career. I mean, Sally Menke, that was the advice she used to give was um, keep your overhead low. And I continue to do that just so that I can say no. I, you know, I only want to do the things that I genuinely give a shit about with people who I like and aren't ever going to yell at me. Like uh, that's, that's really important to me. Um, and if it's important to you, then, um, you know, don't get a car you can't afford yet live cheap for as long as you can but if you're going to work for little to nothing mm -hmm. um don't do anything <laughs> like don't do just anything mm -hmm. be really picky I don't that can feel hard when you're starting but worth it yeah and also sometimes you begin a project and it's not what you expected and it's okay like you said if you're if you're doing it for free to kind of go no, this is not where I want to put my energies. Um, mm. Amazing. Thank you so much. I really love this. Oh, thank you for having me. This is 
such a pleasure. <laughs> Thank you. And I love edit girls. You're <laughs> Thank you for doing it. <laughs>